woman who loves the fields and streams. They filled her through this land of ours and filled the sportsman's dreams. Enjoy what nature holds for us, her bounty never ends. Getting back to basics with the practical sportsman. It's always an adventure, no matter where we go. From a favorite hunting spot to the highest fishing hole. Outdoor life we all can share with family and friends. We'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. And we'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. Hello sportsmen, April is here and for me April has brought allergies, the flu, a little respiratory problems, uh, supposedly nothing that antibiotics can't cure. But despite my problems, this show must go on, and it will, beginning with a home video of some Michigan anglers in Alaska using the most meager of fishing tackle to catch big king salmon. And now outdoor activities don't have to be complicated. Stay tuned. I'll show you how to become a more practical sportsman. What reel you got on there? Oh, the old one I got at the garage sale for five bucks. Nice. Oh, it's a big one. It's a big one. Reel your line in. Big salmon, small boat. Two Michiganians are sharing this adventure in Alaska. Jennifer Dubois from West Olive is working the camera. Her friend Matt has hooked the big salmon, and he looks like he's done this before. His technique of Pumping the rod back, reeling quickly as he lowers the rod, but keeping the rod bent so there's tension on the line at all times, that's a sign of an experienced angler. Jennifer and Matt had a chance to travel to Alaska and videotape their adventures. Now, there's not a more beautiful place to be than in the mountains of our 51st state, the most gorgeous place I can think of to fish for salmon. Matt has reeled the line in up to the flasher, which is just a few feet ahead of the lure. That big salmon, that's just under the surface. I'm not getting drugged by a fish. Oh my gosh. This fish isn't dragging just anybody around this Alaskan lake. He's dragging one of the original practical sportsmen, a guy who watches his money, figures out how to hunt and fish in exotic places without overspending his budget. Think that one's big enough? <laughs> <laughs> Matt adjusts the drag on his reel, a reel that not everybody would put a lot of confidence in. That reel has been around. What reel you got on there? Oh, the old one I got at the garage sale for five bucks. Nice. <laughs> a five dollar reel. Oh, custom. It's getting pretty rusty, but it's doing the job right now. <laughs> The man has confidence in his $5 reel. You will never see this on any other fishing show in America. The reels they use on the other shows all cost top dollar, but they don't sing like this one. Some people might find a squeaky reel to be annoying, but a $5 reel just likes to talk to you when you crank it. Now comes the tricky part of this adventure, netting the fish with one hand and holding the camera with the other. Yeah, hold on, you gotta net, when he comes in, you gotta net him head first. Yeah, you wanna net him head first. Kinda scoop up underneath him. Netting a big salmon is not easy, even if you're using two hands. The net is big and not that easy to maneuver in the water. And the fish is big and powerful and fights to avoid the net at all cost. We'll fall off the boat. As the big fish gets tired, it lets Matt work it around in a circle beside the boat. The idea is to control the fish, lead it around in a circle so that one of these times, when the fish is high enough in the water, it can be led into the net. <laughs> oh my God, it's huge, it is huge. Nope, nope, nope. Around and around we go, <laughs> waiting for the right time. This is going to be a really heavy fish, though. Let go of the net. Hold on. Everything is holding up. The $5 garage sale reel is working admirably. The rod, the line, the hooks, everything seems to be holding. Okay. 
Okay, get. I'll bring him around next. Tough one. Let me do it. Well, kind of, I mean, shit, shit. Oh, you got here. You can't eat. Yeah, this has to be perfect. Finally, the fish tires out, lies on its side, then explodes into the net. Give me the net. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Well, Jennifer did well juggling her video camera and the net. Matt did well landing his trophy salmon on his $5 reel. And this concludes another episode of Jennifer's Alaskan Adventures. <laughs> that big salmon was not the highlight of the story for me. What tickled me the most was the grinding of that yard sale reel. What reel you got on there? Oh, the old one. I got the garage sale for five bucks. Nice. They just don't make fishing tackle like they used to. But you know, there's another use for yard sale fishing tackle. Professional dog trainer Mark Raymond buys ice fishing rods at garage sales. Well, I love to ice fish. It's the only thing, the bait I use, I very rarely pull anything up. But this here, what I will catch with it is a nice puppy. And it's just a pheasant wing. Actually, this is a duck wing. And I'll use that just to get the dog interested and see that he'll point. That's all I want to do with this. If I see a dog, I take this with one of my puppies at 8, 10 weeks of age, and I whip it out there, and that dog points. He might chase for a little while, but he gives me one good point. This is put away. He doesn't need to see this. He's not a sight pointing dog, I want him to scent point. I know now he has the pointing instinct and that's what this is used for. Just simply to see that he has that. And it's a good tool to use when you go purchase a puppy. If you're investigating this litter and you want to purchase a pup, you want to test them, this is a good way to test them. Just because a dog doesn't point at that time doesn't mean that he's not going to, but you get a dog that shows a real stylish point at six and a half, seven weeks, eight weeks of age, then you know this dog has the potential for what you want. And the same thing, you can use it in your, your flushing and retrieving breeds as well, because if they're gonna chase this and they're real excited and fired up, then they have what they need. They don't need to point, but you need to know that they have the drive and desire. So this is one of the best tools I've found for checking that puppy out. Does the puppy know that that's a pheasant or duck wing? I mean. From the scent, or don't they have scent at that age? Oh, yeah. They, they have scent. I've had puppies at five and a half, six weeks old tracking and pointing, scent pointing. I've seen it. But, uh, but on there, this but mainly, it's not the scent. There is scent here. But it's something new, and it's object oh, to nine, chase. Nine uh, all dogs are, uh, I, I shouldn't say all dog pointing breeds, are born with two instincts one to point and one to chase and catch. So this shows then both for that breed, that he has the, the drive to chase this. And when he can't catch it, he points it. A flushing breed, that drive to chase and catch is going to show out as well. Well, kids and puppies, that's a natural. Everybody knows they go together and, and always have a happy time. But you know, in the outdoors, we had this challenge ahead that a lot of clubs, groups, and people have recognized of kids not being involved as much in outdoor activities as they used to be. So how do we turn that around? We're experimenting with all kinds of things on this show. We're looking at, of course, Professor Finn's and the fishing seminars and trying to actually reach parents to get their kids involved. And uh, this Saturday, Nick Van Frankenheisen. Well, his name is Nick. That's what we call him. But it's actually... Heisbert van Frankenhuizen. Heisbert. Heisbert. <laughs> I've been saying Giesbert. Heisbert. Heisbert. I see. Van Frankenheisen from, where were you originally from? The Netherlands. Oh, that's... Uh, Born and raised. For how long? I lived there for 24 years, and I came to America in 1976. And you started working about that time, didn't you, for the Natural Resources Magazine? Right, that's the reason I came to America, was to work for Michigan Natural Resources Magazine. Wow, and, and you were the artist for many years. 17. 
17 years, and yeah. then, of course, recently the magazine went, went into private ownership or something? Yeah, it, uh, well, it's a bad story, but oh well, <laughs> it comes down to a day I lost my job. Lost your job? Because the people that bought the magazine or, yeah, got the magazine, they already had their own people, their own art director, their own photographer, their own whatever. So I was on the street. Well, this, not actually on the street. He didn't actually oh, well, mean that. <laughs> was out of job. Out of a job. And He's actually more in the woods because that's where you live. Right. Uh, right around here near Bath, out in the country, a lot of animals and wildlife. Of course, these, some of these paintings have been on the cover, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, they were all done for Michigan Natural Resources magazine back then, yeah. Uh, just outstanding stuff. Your style is different than a lot of wildlife art. It isn't, you know, the, the real, what do you call it? Realism? Photographic, yeah, realism. The, the photographic yeah. type? Yeah. It has that distinctive, that distinctive, almost a Picasso-like. I mean, I don't know what A I'm little talking. looser, yeah. A little looser, huh? Yeah. The, the, but the reason that we have Nick here is that he's going to be doing this Saturday a class for youngsters right. on how to paint, actually you're talking, or not paint necessarily, draw. I hope to paint with him, yeah. If, if time permits, I'd like to do the drawing and then the painting and have everybody go home with a painting after an hour. And we're asking you to bring your kids out to the museum on Saturday. Of course, it's the puppy day, so there'll be puppies here. Professor Finns will be here. Um, Eddie Ermid will be here with uh, recycled lures. Uh, that's a whole story in itself, Nick. Eddie, Eddie Ermid, he's Dr. Eddie Ermid, our recycologist. But Nick will be here doing uh, some classes for kids, and we'll have a schedule set up. And I suppose, what if an adult wanted to sit That'd in? be fine, too. It usually happens that adults stay. They bring the kids, and then they sit down. And, well, once they sit down, they get a piece of paper, too, and they do the same thing. And you're going to teach them how to draw bears, is that it? Yeah, we can do a bear. I have several uh, animals that we can do. We, we usually don't do the same animal four times in a row mm -hmm. during the four classes during the day. So we'll do one in each session and do the whole thing from very simple shapes, starting out how, to, how do you start with this animal, how do you get it onto the paper, what are the proportions, and how can you do it? And everybody can do it. Okay, well, and you we'll make it real simple. Nick has a book coming out. and. This kind of tickles me because I'm not the only publisher who doesn't hit the deadlines right on schedule. Uh, th this book was supposed to be out already. Today. But it, but it looks like it's going to be more towards the end of the month, The Legend of the Sleeping Bear, full of paintings by Nick. And, of course, this cover here bears, uh, I guess, in the clouds. Yep. The mother bear in the cups and then the north and south Manitou Island, what the story is about, and the Sleeping Bear Dune. Yeah, our famous Sleeping Bear Dunes in Michigan. Well, you've done just tremendous artwork, and you, we're going we're gonna to do another story uh, with Nick sometime coming up. You have some videotape on a, an interesting creature that lives sort of with you. The Great Horn Owl. Yeah, he's been living with us for 13 years. We got him as a baby. He was born or hatched in March, and we picked him up in August, so he was very young. And some kid had raised him or stolen him out of the nest and raised him, and he got confiscated and had to find a home for him. We picked him up thinking we're going to have this owl only for the summer. Well, it's been 13 years. 13 years with an owl. The man has a very interesting background, outstanding artwork, and of course your wife Robin will be here with a lot of your artwork right. here in the museum. Yeah. And it's all free. I mean, come on out, bring the kids, learn how to, how to paint and draw and fish and make recycled things and see the puppies. Should be a good day. Everybody in class will go home with a painting, guaranteed. That they did themselves. That they did themselves. Taught by the master. <laughs> um, Gisbert, Gisbert, Gisbert. Gisbert von Frankenheisen, known as Close. Nick. Well, Nick, good to have you Thank here you. in the museum this Saturday, and I hope you folks come out and bring your kids. It's going to be fun. It's time to dig last fall's frozen game out of your freezer. If you have squirrels or rabbits or, or any small game, try saucy squirrel manicotti sent in by Tim Major of Swartz Creek. Cook six manicotti shells in boiling salted water. Add one tablespoon of minced onion to two tablespoons of water. Now let that stand five minutes. Combine a package of cream cheese with some sour cream sauce mix and a quarter cup of milk. Stir in the softened onions, a can of mushrooms, some parsley, salt, and pepper. Then you add the meat, which could be squirrel or, or any small game, or even chicken or turkey if your freezer is empty. Mix it up, spoon it into the cooked manicotti shells, which you arrange in a baking dish. 
Then you pour cheese sauce that you mixed from the package directions over the shells, sprinkle with Parmesan cheese, bake at 350 for 35 to 40 minutes. Hey, there is nobody who wouldn't like this dish, whether they say they like small game or not. It's creamy, smooth, tasty. Tim Major's recipe will be in the upcoming issue of the Outdoor Digest. A viewer sent me a copy of an article that appeared in the January issue of a National Wild Turkey Federation newsletter, which reported, one of our projects in the Lapeer State game area hasn't been started as planned. We heard rumors about the Sierra Club filing suit against the DNR, and all habitat projects are on hold until the suit is resolved. As most of you know, the Sierra Club is anti-hunting, and in this case, seems to be anti-wildlife. I talked to our area biologist, Julie Oakes, and she said that our information was correct. So, the Sierra Club is squaring off against hunters. Now, on March 20th, the Lansing State Journal reported that the Sierra Club was trying to block the DNR from spending Pittman-Robertson tax money from hunting equipment for hunting projects. The article said, the DNR also has used the money to clear forests for deer habitat, angering environmentalists who opposed the timber cutting. Now, I've always said that it was a big mistake to say that sportsmen and environmentalists were all the same group because we're not. We have different priorities. Now, the Michigan United Conservation Clubs began as a sportsman's group in the 1940s, but in the past 10 years has welcomed organizations like the Sierra Club into its ranks. Now, this just hasn't worked. Recently, Jim Campbell, MUCC's president, wrote a letter to the leaders of MUCC's Sportsman's Club affiliates, which said, in part, if we, the members of MUCC, do not take more active roles in the management of our natural resources, the bunny huggers, the tree huggers, the animal rights activists, the preservationists, and the other extremist groups will continue to destroy wildlife habitat, pollute our waters, use road closures to lock us out of those special places that mean so much to us, and use other ways to destroy our heritage of hunting, fishing, and trapping. Now, this letter was quoted in an article in the Northwoods Call, which also reported a quote from an environmentalist who said, Sounds like something Fred Trost would say. Well, thank you very much. Coming from an environmental extremist, I'm honored. The non-sportsman environmentalists have done enough damage to hunting and fishing organizations, and I think MUCC President Jim Campbell is doing the right thing by trying to weed them out and get MUCC back on track representing hunters and fishermen. I'm sure you're going to see more articles about this environmental war in the news. Kurt Strevel from Roseville was in his shanty while his wife Arlene operated their video camera on a typical ice fishing day during the winter of 1997. Now, the interesting video Arlene took was through the ice of perch going after minnows. Now, it misses a minnow right there, but I tend to think that the perch sucked in another piece of food we couldn't see and wasn't really interested in eating that minnow after all. But watch this. Both fish take baits on Kurt's hooks, and he pulls up a double. It's interesting to see this in slow motion. An apparent miss on the minnow, but there's a grub on a hook on the right. The grub disappears when the perch sucks it in. Then the minnow disappears. Now, fishermen should know that fish do not bite their food. They suck it in. They open their gills and inhale. Perch often suck in a bait, and you don't feel your line move at all. I don't think Kurt would have set the hook unless he saw the perch take his baits. He sees the minnow. Here comes another big one. They're going to take Elmer. I can see that he got it. I'm going to set the hook. Fishing would be easy if we could watch what was happening to our hooks. But most of the time, though, we can't see a thing. Here's a minnow wiggling like it's wounded. Oh, look at that one. That's a nice one. Take it. The thing to learn from this video is that fish suck in their food. They don't bite it. We don't feel most bites because, like these perch, they move in slowly to the bait, fanning their fins. Now, bigger ones might come in faster, but without moving your line, they can suck in the hook, and they'll spit it out 
unless you hook them. So to catch fish, you have to stay alert. Tippy Dam, Wellston, they're, they're, the steelhead is getting better and better. Uh, and of course, the steelhead we're talking, this is what we're talking about. Right here, this picture is of Dale Hooker. He's a good Manistee River steelheader. That's what they were catching just before the walleye season closed. But before that closed, about May 13th and 14th, Rob Ketchum shows a handful of walleye that he got in the local rivers. Tom Oliver got this seven pound river walleye. Uh, I mean, that's a dandy by itself, but look what Buzz Smith caught. 12 pound, four ounce river walleye that came from White River. Outstanding. Only two things left to do. Dial us up on the web and get outdoors. It's a great place to be. See you next week. These were any bigger. I, I mean, it's like, they're like musky. They're like little 10 inch musky. Huge teeth on these smelt. And this was a 10 and a quarter incher. Of course, 10 inches are minimum for a trophy smelt. Some people think 10 inch smell. I mean, come on, little fish. But you knew when you brought this up that you had a something special, huh? Well, not really at first. <laughs> I was fishing for perch, and I was pretty disgusted when we started catching like seven inches because I hate to eat them. But my dad, <laughs> my dad said, "Well, I like to eat them, so just keep them." So I was keeping them, and then I was waited for a little while, and the bobber just slammed down. So I reeled it up. I thought I had a perch on. I was like, "Okay." <laughs> So he came up and I said, looked at my dad and I said, oh no, not again. I opened the door as Shanty pitched it out on the ice. He goes, wait a second, that might be a master angler. So I ran out there real quick and looked at it. And then I rearranged it real nice in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, that is a huge smelt. Who mounted this? Uh, Brown's taxidermy. And is this a freeze dry or a regular mount? That's uh, a regular skin mount. He had a tough oh. time. <laughs> tough time, what do, you, uh, what do you charge you for it? Sixty dollars. Sixty bucks? That's pretty good. That's like, you know, six bucks an inch. That's a sixty dollar smelt right there. <laughs> but that is really worth something in the record books. Raymond Cedar Home, you're right at the right at the top of the record books in the smelt category. Congratulations.